the floor is yours, Mikhail. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur de Montreal. Let me start with a question. What is the real purpose of healthcare? What are health systems supposed to deliver to the people using them? And these questions might be less obvious than you initially think. And they have everything to do with the topic that we are talking about today, mental health. And I'm coming from an international organization, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And I am there working in the health division. And our slogan is just something you see on the wall when you enter the OECD is better policies for better lives. So we do a lot in all areas of health and healthcare. And some time ago, I said to a colleague of mine, why are we so often talking about mental health as a separate topic, but we never talk about somatic health. And maybe this is because we unconsciously assume that when talking about health, somatic health is sort of the default. That is to say, is there something wrong physically? It's crystal clear to most people that we are talking about a health problem. With mental health problems, this is sometimes less obvious. In, so in general, like you mentioned in your introduction, we could say that it's, uh, it's hugely neglected and also highly underestimated. Also in terms of, of economic figures, we have found that across the OECD, which is um, definitely not the whole world, but it's 37 member countries, uh, about 50% of the population will encounter some mental health issue somewhere in life. The costs of mental health problems add up uh, to about 3.5 to 4% of GDP across the OECD. So we are talking about a huge and massive problem here. And maybe we are thinking too much in a, a dichotomy here, mental and somatic elements uh, of health, because these two are strongly interconnected. But this mental aspect may not always receive the attention it deserves in health policy. Now back to our question, what is exactly what health systems, systems should produce? And how do we know that our health systems are actually doing a good job? Now, the performance measurement of health systems has a relatively short history, which goes back to the 20th century. And in the 20th century, we would say the outcomes of health systems, life expectancy, uh, the curing diseases, because when we live long and free of diseases, we are healthy, right? And this may have made a lot of sense in the 20th century and where this was the dominant idea of a healthcare, which was quite episodic, a curative approach. So something is wrong, patient goes to the doctor, doctor fixes the problem, but that's not for a more important part of healthcare, it's not no longer the reality we live in today. The populations in most countries have, have changed dramatically over the past decades. We all have aging populations, and this goes hand in hand with the continuous increase of chronic conditions. In our morning session, Alexandre de Gemeels already mentioned that, uh, that this is a massive uh, problem. And in the age group of 65 years and older, for instance, uh, we see that across the OECD, about six out of 10 people live with two or more chronic conditions. So note that the overall prevalence is actually quite higher. We're talking about multi-morbidity here. In the overall population, this is about one third. And yes, we need to work on prevention. There's a lot that we can do but a major part of this population, they are never going to be cured. They are live, living with these conditions and they rely on healthcare to manage their conditions and to provide regular 
continuous care, prescribed medication, provide lifestyle counseling, etc. The purpose of health systems is not so much curing these diseases and lengthening life, it's mainly about quality of life. It's supporting people in what really matters to them. And this is something that cannot be measured simply in clinical outcome measures. You can only get this information by asking patients about the outcomes and experience with care. So when it comes to mental health, we should not just think about disorders or mental diseases. I mean, this is certainly important, but also we should think about the overall quality of life in general. Now, this may sound a bit abstract, but we are talking about uh, a straightforward thing here. Are people able to do their work? Can they engage in social activities? Or are they hampered in doing this by pain, by concerns, by fatigue, uh, limitations in their mobility, sleeping problems? These are all things that people with conditions are struggling with and that we can measure. It's really what, about what matters to people and health systems should help people realizing their own goals and help, help living meaningful, good quality lives. And for some of us, this may be a life full of ambition. For others, it's uh, have reached a stage in their life where we're talking about being able to be with your grandchildren, to walk your dog, etc. Now at OECD, we are, um, we are proud to have the biggest database with healthcare related data in the world. We have massive amounts of data because health systems are collecting these data, prescriptions, admissions, mortality, morbidity, costs, etc. But little of these data, I mean, this, this is all important. It's useful information for health policy, but such data are usually not reflecting the essential questions. Do health systems deliver what people need? Do health systems enable people to live this meaningful, to live this meaningful life? And such information is still extremely scarce. Note that this is um, just not just my personal mission to get more of this information. As OECD, we talk a little bit with, with our governments, with member states. And in uh, 2017, we had our health ministerial meeting that we uh, do uh, once about every five years. And during this meeting, the health ministers across the OECD agreed that a new generation of health reforms was needed. That we need to make this move towards what we called people-centered health systems, systems that are organized around the needs of patients and ask patients how they feel about the outcomes of their care. And now I know that, that I mean, it's difficult to disagree with that. It's, you might say it's, it's maybe easy to reach a political momentum for that because how can you be against it, you know, health systems that serve patients. Uh, the issue here is how are we going to, to walk the talk? How are we going from narrative to action? And the first logical step is to quote uh, Juliette Tuakli this morning, data, data, data. We need to start measuring internationally and systematically patient reported indicators. Let's start taking patients seriously and take what they report on their outcomes seriously. And a major misconception here, I think, is that we are talking about soft data. It's not soft data. It's, we talk about really well-validated instrument. There's a lot of scientific rigor and a lot of academic work has been done on how you can measure such outcomes. But it is currently a situation of uh, either these tools are not being used or it's a situation of many flowers blooming. So there are a lot is being measured, but it's difficult to compare. It's difficult to, uh, to internationally learn from each other because everybody is doing it slightly differently. 
Now, let's end with the good news that countries across the OECD have joined forces to start developing, uh, implementing international standards for this uh, under the flag of what we call Paris, the Patient Reported Indicator Surveys Initiative. And in the past, we have uh, you you may have heard about um, uh, successful programs, international programs that we had, like for instance PISA in education, where there we have developed an international standard to compare the performance of students um, all over the world. And this has been a real game changer in the world of education. This has uh, also encourage countries to reform their educational system and we hope that Paris will be the PISA for healthcare. So we are currently for instance working on the international survey of people with chronic conditions who are managed in primary care setting. This is the, the most rapidly growing group of healthcare users across the OECD and how well these people are served the care that they receive, it's mainly a black box. And what we are going to do is, you're going to open this black, this black box. And the information coming from Paris will help policymakers to identify uh, best practices and will also facilitate international learning in this area. Now, just to end with a few uh, take home messages. Just like we have been comparing life expectancy, costs, morbidity, and so on internationally, we should also learn from each other by observing to what extent our health systems are successful in meeting the needs of patients. There's a lot room to improve and to learn from each other. We can only do this by taking this information seriously. Don't think of it as soft data. It is essential data. It's about the very essence of healthcare. And just like we develop international standards for all these other measures, we must develop such standards for patient reported measures. Lastly, mental health is something uh, that I think deserves more attention in health policy. We should not only pay attention to it when we are talking about psychiatric, psychiatric labels, so, but, but somatic and mental health are closely interconnected. And we should ask people about it and should it should be in the center of healthcare in general. Uh, back to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Let me ask you one uh, simple question because the whole conference is about global governance, that is issues of, uh, well, the political uh, consequences of interdependence. So my question is, in your judgment, what is the global governance dimension of healthcare at the global level? Well, you know, this is actually a topic that is really on top of the international agenda at this moment, uh, as, you, uh, as you may know also on the level of European Commission, because if there is one thing that this pandemic has taught us that healthcare and health policy is much more an international issue than we may often think. And we have, and this is also um, how I see the role of international organization. We have 37 member states. Um, in all these member states, these countries are struggling with the same issues. They see the same demographic, epidemiologic changes and are struggling with the same um, the same challenges. And I think um, I like to, to think about this in terms of the, uh, how I call it international learning. There's a lot to to learn from each other and to uh, to identify best practices internationally, because we what we definitely know that some health systems across the world are performing much better than others and there that there is a huge opportunity to to exchange and to learn lessons from that thank you well there is a question i'm going to ask you but the uh, other uh, two speakers as well you know uh, mental uh, health mental diseases are usually classified as non communicable diseases but this is the way they are classified usually and um, as uh, an amateur if i may say so i wonder if, if it is true 
uh, is it not true that a mental disease ill may be communicable diseases, which would of course increase the international uh, dimension? What do you think, Mikhail? Yeah, well, strictly spoken, it's definitely a non-communicable disease. We can we can easily uh, agree on that. Oh, the, uh, on the usual, in the usual sense, yes. Yes, but, but I think I get I get your points. Uh, this division between communicable disease, non-communicable disease, is a very rough. I mean, it's only two groups. I think there is definitely uh, something more in that because it's not uh, probably there is a similarity here with other non-communicable diseases. Lifestyle, what we call lifestyle diseases, that there are certain uh, societal developments going on that definitely affects mental health of populations. And uh, well, we're living in uh, strange times these days with the COVID 19 pandemic. I mentioned in your introduction, it's a very good uh, example uh, where we all. I mean, we all in the same boat, we are in this pandemic together and you see that the impact also on the mental health of populations is, um, is huge. It's, um, it's, it's a big issue. Thank you very much. So now uh, let me move to uh, Professor Roberto Burioni.